every morning it's a privilege to wake up knowing that our team is producing your food. From our farm, we harvest lamb and mutton, prime beef, wool that makes the best carpets in the world, oats that get you going in the morning with your breakfast cereals, your muesli and energy bars, wheat and barley that are an ingredient in over a thousand different products. Down on the farm, we know that we've been lent a little corner of the globe to look after for about a generation and then pass it on in a better state than when we started. New Zealand is the perfect environment to perform agriculture. Conservation and agriculture go hand in hand. In fact, they enhance each other. Because of technology, over the next few decades, more than half of our jobs are going to disappear. But I can't imagine my role as a farmer being superseded by a robot. But technology will be the game changer that keeps New Zealand agriculture on the cutting edge. Technology helps me connect and understand our environment so that I can do our job a little bit better. Although my topic today is about drones and agriculture, it's way bigger than that. It's about agricultural resilience and succession. We have to solve who is going to produce our wonderful food and how we retain young, bright people in agriculture. At the moment, agricultural succession is not much better than a story I heard about a little boy and his mum that were heading off to the hospital to see uh, granddad, probably for the last time. And as they arrived at the hospital, the little boy ran upstairs and said to his granddad, 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 make a noise like a frog. And the granddad said, make a noise like a frog? And the wee boy says, yep, because mum says when you croak, we're all off to Disneyland. <laughs> as a farmer producing your food, when we, uh, Philippa, my wife and I got started, we knew that we had to do things a little bit differently than the norm if we were going to be a successful business. So over a period of time, we listed out our many values, and they were too many to put up on a wall in a poster or in a document that would positively influence the culture of our business. So we chose to narrow them down to two usable ones. The first was a decision-making process that empowered everybody in our business to make good decisions, and we didn't want to put in layers of bureaucracy that stifled the wonderful, innovative minds that we had around us. The second value is where we encourage ownership, not entitlement. We make stakeholders feel part of our goals, and this gives them ownership and a greater vision. They feel they are part of a bigger story than just themselves. This little girl on the screen, um, she's the one in the gumboots, was, <laughs> was born in 2006. She was three years old when this photo was taken, and I've had the privilege of being her dad now for nine years. Statistically, we know that she has a good chance of living until the year 2100, and we can't even begin to imagine the technological changes that she will see in her lifetime. She's what we call a digital native. So when she picks up a new bit of technology, she gets it, she understands it straight away. She's very comfortable and she learns it quickly. As for me, I'm a little different. At best, I am a digital immigrant. My children have many other names for me than digital immigrant. But it's a real struggle to learn new, new technologies and an even bigger struggle to keep up with the rate of change. When our children leave our home, they're going to leave a huge hole in our IT infrastructure. <laughs> You'll all remember when the first GPS navigational systems came out. Tom Tom and Navmen. And once you mastered the art of punching in the address in the right country, and especially if you had larger fingers, once you got all that sorted, they were a real marriage saver. <laughs> because, like most of you, um, if you were in the driver's seat, you would re receive your instructions on where to turn at the intersection about 100 metres after you'd got through it. 
Our journey with drones started with an absolute frustration with how many cast sheep we were getting on our farm. And that's where a sheep eats a lot of grass, rolls over onto its back for a bit of a scratch and can't get up, a bit like some of us on Christmas Day. <laughs> and if they can't get up, they're going to die. So back in 2011, I'd come in from the farm after picking up 15 of the car, these car sheep. Fortunately, they were all all right, but I knew that we had just dodged a bullet. So as I came in and I discussed the issue with my family and how we were going to solve it, my then 11-year-old son, Mark, was watching at the same time a documentary about the use of drones in Afghanistan. And as we discussed the two issues, he said... Why don't we get one for the farm? <laughs> so I googled drones and came up with a military version that was worth $51 million. And because we're sheep farmers, we brought two of them. <laughs> eight months later, I was at the air to cart stage on a website or in a drone. Most of that eight months, we'd spent hesitating because we weren't sure of what people would think of a drone flying around the countryside, which is a bit silly looking back. We got the price down to four grand and thought the drone would add 50 grand worth of value to our business. It was ordered from the US, came from Mexico, and had made in China written all over it. <laughs> Within a few hours of arriving, I was flying the drone and we were receiving live camera footage. Finally, we had eyes in the sky. Finally, we had something that we could safely send out to monitor our stock. Over the past four years, we've been using the drones we have developed a list of our 400 potential applications, and that's just in agriculture alone, and I'm sure there are a lot more sin in your minds. One of these applications is where we send the drone out on a pre-planned mission or a mission controlled by the remote. The drone will fly out to a preset paddock and take a snapshot of that paddock using the onboard camera, then automatically crop the paddock to the exact boundaries, grid reference the paddock, and then the software will automatically count the white dots and the data will be sent to your laptop. It can even differentiate between the mothers, which we call ewes, and the lambs. This will allow us to accurately stock a paddock and for security check that they are all there. Here we are monitoring stock as they enter a paddock which goes from 100 metres in altitude to over 300 metres above sea level. This mob of 3,200 sheep need regular monitoring and is unsafe to tackle these hills on a four-wheeler in the winter time. Both mum and dad have rolled their quads in the last four years, and in mum's case, if she had not had a mobile phone with her, she probably would have spent a while out in their chilly conditions, which probably would have gone, wouldn't have gone too well. Dad probably wouldn't have noticed she was missing until he got home and dinner wasn't cooked or something like that. <laughs> The more we use our drone, the less time we spend on quads, which makes our farm a lot safer. There is a New Zealand company that is working on an application where they can map the nutrient status of the soil from the air. This will allow us to accurately apply fertiliser, maximising production whilst protecting the environment. The hardware on these drones is pretty cool, but it's the software that is truly amazing. Software that allows the drone to fly back to where it took off from in the event of a problem, Sense and avoid technology that will make the drone take evasive action in the case of emergency. And GPS software that allows the drone to fly fully autonomously, and that's pretty necessary when Dad's involved. <laughs> this project has allowed me lots of overseas travel, financed some of my toys, and it's been pretty cool cruising around the conferences with Dad. But as soon as they're done, we're off to the theme parks. You can see I had to twist Mark's arm to get him to do this <laughs> slot. Back in 2012, we'd been using a drone quite privately without anybody knowing for about a month when we were contacted by the media. The story went viral around the globe, especially amongst agricultural channels. This proved to be a real distraction from what we were trying to accomplish. But what it did do is it brought a whole lot of people out of the woodwork that were keen to support us. 
medical academics, agricultural academics, school teachers, students, and other farmers. And to date, I have not heard from one a farmer that doesn't see potential in this technology. About two months later, because of all the media coverage, we were contacted by the Civil Aviation Authority, and uh, they arrived down to the farm for a wee chat. And uh, <laughs> as they walked into our house and saw the drone sitting on the table, they said, you are not to call this machine a drone because of the negative military connotations. You are to call it an RPAVS or UAVS. And I said, hey, chaps, I already know the alphabet, and we kind of like the name drones. And that's, and that's been crucial as we develop this technology for agriculture, because if you've got a young person that's familiar with a PlayStation and then with remote controls, and then if you give them a bit of responsibility with a drone and we link that or connect that to agriculture, it's been a real game changer for us. Civil Aviation Authority has some real challenges going forward because in the past they've always had the high ground because of the cost of entry into aviation. Once again, a government agency will regulate the compliant users whilst finding it hard to control the recreational users. Typical response? will be to over-regulate and put real pressure on the economic benefits of this technology. We've faced some challenges as we develop this for agriculture. It's been a long time since I've been in a university lecture theatre, and it's been a long time since some of our agricultural academics have been on a farm. Our industry has created this huge void between science and its application. We need to connect in the middle because it would be a real shame for agriculture to miss out on some of the wonderful developments that have happened in R&D. It's crucial that major science projects, that their commercialisation is incentivised and this would go a long way to bridging the gap. Privacy of the public has been another challenge with several members of the public making false accusations against us. We totally respected people's privacy before we owned a drone, and nothing has changed. I believe privacy breaches are about the values of the pilots and the people operating the cameras, but it's too easy to make drones the scapegoat. The average age of a New Zealand sheep farmer is 58 years old. Makes me kind of young. They are not digital natives, but a small percentage of them will embrace this technology. But the future of our wonderful food production is encouraging young, passionate people into agriculture. If your son and daughter is enthusiastic, bright, motivated, and love the outdoors, then encourage them into agriculture. But if they're not, maybe they should consider law school. The greatest message that is coming from this drone story is that we are connecting technology with food production and making agriculture an attractive vocation again. In one case, I heard from a mum and she screamed down the phone, I could kiss you. She went on to say that their son, who had grown up on the farm but never really interested in going farming and now was in his second year at university doing science papers, because of this drone story, he has shifted from his science degree and chosen to do one with an agricultural focus. But more importantly for this family, he has indicated that he wants to come home for the farm. When I think about the last four years and the journey that our family has been on, I can't think of anything better than doing projects with my two teenage boys and my little girl. Agriculture is not compulsory in our family, but I can't think of another thing that I would rather be doing. I cannot think of a better place to bring up a family, discovering with those children the values that they will need to be successful people. In 1948, nearly 70 years ago, my dad, along with his brother, went to their dad and, and said, can we buy a tractor to do the agricultural work on the farm to replace the horses. Granddad said, 
Definitely not. He said that these tractors will be the death of agriculture in New Zealand. Twelve months later, when one of the horses stumbled and sprained its ankle, Grandad was forced to go back on that decision and allow the boys to buy a tractor. But he said that these tractors were to do the secondary light work while the horses remained doing the heavy work. And he repeated that these tractors will be the death of agriculture in New Zealand. We will always face resistance to change in technology, but those people that embrace it will truly be the winners. Thank, Thank you. you.